Hey guys, welcome to another Trade Genius Podcast. Bob and Phil here as always. You know, we've recently pulled back. So is this a pullback in a big bull market or is this the start of something more bearish and we're heading lower? We're gonna talk about what you need to know in this video. Trade Genius. Hey guys, really briefly before we jump into this video, appreciate all the likes and subscribes. And if you can ring that notification button, that really helps us out. In addition to that, if you guys don't mind, head over to tradegenius.co, check out our specials we have over there. We're running our February specials. There's a number of different specials with different packages for all different experience types. If you're more into education, we have a package for that. If you'd just like to get into the room, primarily we have a package for that as well, where you can see where we're calling out trades and things like that live and also posting signals into our Discord signal rooms. So check it out, tradegenius.co, appreciate you you doing that. So Bob, once again, you've dug up some juicy tidbits on the market and kind of what we've been saying seems like there's issues under the hood. So let us have it. What's going on? Yeah. I don't know how many different ways I could say, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and this, this is a really interesting one because it is really, really hard to do what's happening now because Wall Street and, and corporate CFOs are adept at not uh, missing their earnings estimates. Okay. Because they guide them down, you know, and they help the analyst guide down so they can beat them. Right. When you stop beating your earnings estimates, things are so bad that you were so embarrassed that you couldn't even tell the analyst to take it any lower. Okay. <laughs> and last time this happened was 2007, 2008, into the great financial crisis. And that's what's happening now, Phil. So, you know, we're, we're at a point now where I don't know, they don't know how to lie anymore. And, and we're going to get to a point which is really interesting. And you remember this from 2008, where they all look around at each other and say, shoot, let's take the baby out with the bathwater. And they just start dumping everything to get just to clear the books. Right. And and that's how you know you're knee deep into it when they just when they just give up and they they actually start injecting truth, you know, into the conference calls. And, and we're getting there now. These conference calls and these estimates and these these earnings have, have been abysmal. The beats are negative, but the earnings are down nine percent to fill. The um, comment on this chart here is is like we're at zero, right? The the percentage of earnings beats that were actually look a little negative. You don't go there without a recession. Like that's, you know what I mean? Like that's clearly what this chart yeah. is showing. Even in 2020, we had a brief little recession because of the COVID thing, but that got down to a, a what? Shallow reading of maybe just over 0%. And then obviously uh, 2007 and eight just plunged through zero, which looks eerily similar to what what's happening here, meaning that the next quarter probably we see worsening conditions on, on earnings misses. So I just, for those of you listening and can't see the chart, this thing's doing exactly what we saw in 2007 into 2008. So anyway. Yeah, it's a big problem. So, uh, but, and so I want to tie this into the, the next chart too. This is from one of the, uh, the major Wall Street banks and uh, they, they have a proprietary uh, cycle chart that they use. And, and you can see it's, you know, it's a coincidental chart, which means that it's showing you what's happening in real time. It doesn't really have anything predictive. It's just warning you that, hey, the cycle's rolling over. And uh, just another warning flag, the cycle's going down as well. So earnings are, are not getting beat and the cycle's turning over. And, you know, and you can feel it in the air. You know, I don't know about you, but you can just feel it in the air and it that, that you don't have the that enthusiasm that you know that you had before it's almost like it, everybody has their their nose to the grindstone doing everything they can to keep this market from going up and even today in the market phil as you know um you know the index was nominally a, a bullish day but underneath you know tesla had an island top okay that's bearish and i think it was bearish engulfing island top from the Two days ago, when they formed the left side of the, you know, the the framework for an island, and what an island top is that you have a gap up, and then the next day you have a gap down, yeah, and you leave basically trades up there all by themselves. Yep, that's very bearish. Yep, and 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 they bullishly and bearishly engulf the other side, which means two days ago, the high and low were inside of the high and low of today, and so. And that's a warning flag. I look at Tesla every day. I trade Tesla a lot too, as you know. We traded it today. That's kind of like the canary in the coal mine to me because as Tesla goes, 
If they can't keep Tesla up, they give it up. And, and Tesla is down pretty smartly today. Yeah, so you know the cycle indicator is turning, just turning red here. And it, that happened into COVID, that happened into the great financial crisis, happened into the dot-com bubble. So one more confirmation that it looks recessionary ahead. All right. Yeah, and, and then, then the, the next chart is is um, the one that you've... you've um, yeah, you uh, wanted to talk about the yield curve, and I said, "Well, we already we worked yeah. that one up." But anyway, here it is. Yeah, and I, I found a different chart, but this one really helps us understand it better. We made a new low in terms of the uh, inversion of the yield curve, and that's like scary stuff. That means there's a lot of pressure on the system that the um, the short rates that are so much higher than the medium term, people are willing to borrow um, to borrow money farther out at lower rates than they are today, which is telling you there's a lot of stress in the system. And I'm going to let you kind of take it from here because, you know, you've looked up the data. Why are we even looking at this? So can you explain the the 100 week thing, Phil? Okay, yeah. So, you know, the, whenever the yield curve inverts, it's, you know, it's, it's a big deal because that's really the bond market telling you that troubles on the horizon. And the bond market's always right, in my opinion. It just, it really is. I don't think you get you know, much in the way of false readings from them or, or, or head fakes. So what I did was I went back and I overlaid. So on the top, you have the yield curve and it's circled where it inverts and, and you can see the line turns from that uh, aqua color to that reddish color. Okay, that's where it starts to invert. And I line it up with the stock market below the S&P 500. And so you can see that when you go into an inverted state on the yield curve, that means the um, the two and the 10 yield curve or, or difference in their rates went from positive because normally the 10 year rewards you more in terms of, of yield because you're giving the government, you know, your money for longer. But in times of stress, the shorter t duration bonds will actually pay more than the longer duration bonds. And so that's why you have a yield curve inversion, just, just to kind of clear that out of the way. But basically what it does is it's usually basically signaling that a recession is coming. What's interesting about this is that when you go to the yield curve inversion and you take the lowest point that it inverted and then it jumps back up, and, and that's what I have highlighted there above with those shaded rectangles. Those are 100 weeks roughly of where it goes from the, the peak yield curve inversion back up to where it normally hangs out over 2%. And 2.3% usually rings the bell. So that whole, that whole process of renormalizing the yield curve inversion is a 100 week process. So that sounds good, right? Yield curve goes back to normal? No, not for the, not for the stock market because typically what goes, what happens when that is the case is that the Fed is then getting less aggressive and they're cutting rates. And when they start to cut rates, then the yield curve start to normalize and they're cutting rates because there's trouble in the economy. And typically that's a recession. So while it sounds good that, yeah, the yield curve runs up and, and normalizes, the, the act of doing that is extremely bearish. And usually it's because there's a recession going on. So you can see below the red arrows on the stock market as, the, as we went back up and shot back up to 2.3% on the yield curve, the whole time the stock market was just taking a beating. And one thing we haven't really seen, and if you look over there on the right, where we have those kind of projected red bars on the S&P 500 and that lower pane, we really haven't seen that part of this bear market play out yet. And we typically get that kind of very sharp, steep, waterfall effect and then it's over so it's like you go through like two months of just kind of like panic like it's never going to end and then it, and then it kind of just crescendos and it's over and then we're back to getting ready for the next run so that's what you're seeing here on this chart and it's just yet another thing telling you that hey you know the, another warning flag that on top of all the other data points that you've just seen this is probably the most powerful one telling you that a recession is probably 95 percent probable at this point yeah and god help us if the yield curve normalizes by the the 10 year coming up to meet the two year. Okay. <laughs> Cause that's, that's max stagflation. And you, you would see the S and P 500 just melt away. And that's still a very much a possibility. And we're going to talk a little bit about next week about Russia and China's role in potentially making that happen. So stay tuned next week. Bob, one last thing before we jump to your chart, I wanted to just point out is that if we do another hundred weeks, keep in mind, you know, that's going to affect most risk on assets. And I know a lot of you guys have been talking about the Bitcoin halving. So be open to maybe the halving cycle gets really flat, right? We're expecting it to start cranking up now. And that's why a lot of people thought that this jump up off of uh, the, the lows here was the start of the next halving run. Normally, I would totally agree. I mean, it has all the hallmarks of, of doing the right things. But if this is going to play out and we're going to have 100 weeks of kind of swimming upstream, that 
normal curve up into 2024 might be very, very flat. And we could be flat through 2024 fighting this. Now, I will say caveat to that is if we get into the supply shock, and, and what I mean by that is all the supply on the exchanges gets gobbled up because there's just a big accumulation of spot, then you can maybe throw that out the window because then eventually that's going to spike price. But if that doesn't happen and we're just following along with the equities, be open to that. This cycle pump might be really delayed if we're dealing with this, you know, because we're talking about a better part of two years trying to trying to get through this mess. So on the upside, tons of opportunity to just have killer long swing trades going, you know, beyond 2025, but be open that this might take a little longer than normal. So that's all. Oh, perfect. And I want to end this on some some positive news here because this market is eminently tradable. We, we had an awesome week this week trading. And one of the things I've been talking about forever is uranium. And I put uh, some arrows down where, you know, our heat indicator and money flow and Ranger were all telling us another move was coming in CCJ. And we literally have a move that's nearly 50 50 five zero percent higher here. You know, since the beginning of the year, they reported the earnings were good. The market rewarded it. And so I just put out a couple levels to where the next resistance areas are in CCJ. I'm pretty confident we're going to get there sooner than later. And then once we breach that area, the next area for CCJ is in the is I think in the high 40s, but we'll follow along with it. And the whole uranium space is going to just be dragged along right with it. You know, so URA, URG, quad U, which is U U U U, you know, DNN. There's a there's a lot of names out out there uh, for you to uh, to follow. But these are the two I traded, CCJ and DNN. And I have, I mean, uh, Quad U, and I have a couple Canadian spec juniors, but uh, more for lotto picks. But I want to end with that, Phil. Uh, and I think, you know, we're going to try to show you guys more charts too, because this market's very tradable right now because the volatility is picking up. And I don't think this market's just going to simply collapse. I think what's going to happen is, is that there's going to be massive winners and massive losers here. And we, we could see that, you know, with these algorithms and indicators that we have. So um, just stay tuned. If there's any charts that you guys want us to talk about, throw them in the room. You know, we, we'd be happy to throw them up uh, on the podcast and, and share them with us. You know, you're taking the time to listen to me and Phil. We're happy to kind of give you the information that can help you become more effective traders. So thanks for that, Phil. And um, you guys enjoy your weekend. All right, guys. See you in the next video. Take care. Trade Genius.